I can appreciate your wisdom in bringing forth this issue in our community. The time is impeccable. We cannot complain about the symbols and images that white racists project without purging our souls of the toxic images we have accepted that keep us from celebrating our true beauties, as well as our cultural and spiritual values in this world. I was born and raised in New Orleans, but left when I was 17 years old. Periodically, I would visit, I would return to visit my family. And one of those visits in 1980, I happened to be in New Orleans during Mardi Gras. I was shocked that the negative portrayal of our people, African people, was still parading through the streets, influencing the minds of our children and the generations to follow. When Spike Lee produced Bamboozled, my comment at the time was, he could die the next day and that film would be his legacy. Little did I know years to follow, he would wind up being the king grand marshal of the Zulus on Mardi Gras day. He too drank the Kool-Aid. The Izulu people were the most potent opponents of the invasion of the English and Boers in South Africa. They, through, mili through the military genius of Chaka Zulu, defied and fought against the oppression by the Europeans, and they paid an extreme price for it. As Ralph Bunch said when he visited South Africa, the Zulus have become known as the Uncle Toms of South Africa. Because the English, why? Because the English and the Boers wanted to make an example out of them to put other Africans on notice. They broke their spirit to the point where the Zulus were used as extreme weapons, i.e. slaughterers, against other black South Africans during apartheid. Do we as black people know our history? Do the Zulus of New Orleans know this history? They say their blackface is a parody when in fact it is instead an act of genocide. As a people, we need to heal from the schizophrenia that we have accepted as normal and excusable. Hmm. <laughs> oh, and then next we're going to go, I'm sorry, into um, a video of some history that Take em Down NOLA workers have gone into archives to um, accumulate. So we're going to share that here now. Tradition. It's a big part of how people define who we are, our values, identity, and our communities. Which is why people feel personally attacked and often very upset when their most important traditions are questioned. This is why the reaction was strong when Take Em Down Nola held a press conference in front of the Zulu Social Aid and Pleasure Club's headquarters, asking publicly that they end their 110-year-old tradition of marching and Mardi Gras in blackface. The demand came after many attempts to have safe conversations with Zulu members in private, and after battling prominent displays of white supremacy at Mardi Gras in New Orleans, like the distribution of Confederate paraphernalia and blackface figurines from parade floats. The black community and its allies were reasonably hurt by those incidents and demanded change. Likewise, when several private pictures of white politicians dressed in blackface recently emerged in the public eye, it made people question whether those politicians were racist whether they were fit for office, and rightfully so. But to question the Zulu blackface tradition, and it is a tradition that comes directly out of the very racist, anti-black culture of turn of the 20th century blackface minstrelsy, is to question a long-standing local practice that Zulu members view as a form of black empowerment. Zulu's members in 2019 tend to explain the meaning of their blackface tradition in one or all of the following ways, though they have not always done so historically. One. The blackface is meant to honor the working class black founders of Zulu, 
who could not afford the expensive mask of either the white or black upper classes at Mardi Gras. So, as the story goes, they chose the inexpensive face paint of a blackface minstrel show. This story is why members sometimes even deny that their practice is blackface at all, asking people to call it black makeup, a distinction without much of a difference. It's also a distinction that Zulu's members only recently began to make as controversy about the tradition grew. Throughout most of their 110-year-old club history, members have repeatedly called their tradition blackface in the press. Zulu's membership and writers, all of whom are required to wear blackface by club rules, has also included white people for decades. It is no longer just a practice confined to a local black community that might understand Zulu's history and intended meaning. People unfamiliar with Zulu's history come to New Orleans by the thousands every year for Mardi Gras and experience the Zulu parade as a modern day menstrual show. Some even see it as a license to don blackface themselves, reckoning that if black New Orleanians consider it a proud and not so racist tradition, they can too. So even if Zulu was once a working class organization that thumbed its nose at the black bourgeoisie and the white ruling class, it now includes city council members, politicians, prominent business owners, and those with a great deal of economic privilege when compared to the club's working class founders. Two, that the practice of dressing up in a kind of bastardized Zulu garb grass skirts, grease paint, nappy wigs, coconuts, at one point with their king donning a large tin four crown and a banana stock scepter, is meant to honor the Zulu people of South Africa or highlight a feeling of respect and kinship with black African people. But plenty of New Orleanians, Africans, and actual Zulus have criticized the practice as indistinguishable from the racist ways that white culture has portrayed African peoples as incompetent, dirty, and uncivilized. In order to understand this complicated tradition and why black New Orleanians still cling to practices like blackface minstrelsy, we owe it to ourselves to look carefully at the history and origins of this tradition. Because the time in which it emerged was very different than our own. Black people had complicated ways of negotiating daily life, making a living and expressing themselves artistically in a world drenched in segregation and blackface minstrelsy. In 1909, at the time of the Zulu Social Aid and Pleasure Club's official formation by John Metoye, a black laborer, blackface minstrelsy was America's most popular form of stage entertainment. It was a time when black performers would not have been admitted to the stage to perform for whites, or in many places at all, without having to wear the black grease paint and racist stereotypes of minstrelsy. Even many of New Orleans' early jazz luminaries had to blacken up in order to perform, including celebrated jazz pianist Jelly Roll Morton, who said, Of course I had a burnt cork on my face, and my lips were painted like they were big and white, but since everybody was doing it, I didn't let it get to me. This view was commonplace. The notion that blackface made white audiences comfortable and excited. Com yes. Really? Comfortable yes. in what way? They, they, weren't, uh, they weren't comfortable having someone on a stage above them, looking down on them, uh, being held up on a pedestal. They, they were not comfortable with, 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 with watching. They would never have been comfortable and were not um, with watching black actors no. play, let us say, serious role. You know perfectly well why, because America was very racist. Of course they weren't. Slavery was all about creating um, visions, types, stereotypes of an entire race of people as subhuman in every way. Most popular historical resources, including the Zulu Social Aid and Pleasure Club's website, profess that it was an African-American blackface minstrel troupe called The Smart Set that performed the skit at the Pythian Theater in 1909 that inspired the masking tradition of Zulu, with a song titled, There Never Was and Never Will Be a King Like Me. But other Zulu historians and journalists cite good evidence that earlier in the 20th century, Zulu's members pointed to the Black Patty Troubadours, a different African-American minstrel troupe, as their inspiration. Indeed, a November 25, 1939 article in the Louisiana Weekly about the death of Zulu founder John Matoye reads, Receiving the idea of King Zulu from Black Patty, a show that was popular at the Pythian Temple, 
Mr. Mutoye banded together several of his friends and formed what was later to be one of the city's most popular and colorful parades. Today, people from all over the world come to New Orleans to see King Zulu and his revelers. Our researchers went through many years of historical press coverage and the surviving repertoire of both minstrel groups. And we agree that it was most likely Black Patty's touring company that was responsible for the image of the first Zulu king in a show called A Trip to Africa. The confusion about which troupe performed the show seems understandable, though, because the two lead performers of the smart set, Salem Tut Whitney and J. Homer Tut, performed with the Black Patty show regularly, and both groups staged touring shows at the Pythian Theaters in the years surrounding Zulu's founding. In A Trip to Africa, African-American blackface performer Jolly John Larkin sings a number called The King Like Me as King Rastus of the Zulus. Here's the only photograph that we could locate of Larkin dressed as the Zulu king in A Trip to Africa. Unfortunately, because the image was so badly degraded before it was digitized, it's hard to tell much about what his costume and makeup look like. Yet he's clearly not in a grass skirt, and he wears a cape somewhat reminiscent of European monarchy. We do have ample descriptions of Black Patty's stage shows appearing in newspapers and advertisements. One notice for the show from the Daily Signal of Crowley, Louisiana, dated November 22, 1907, reads, a rapid-fire melody of song, story, dance with Negro melody, darky fun, the buck dance, the cakewalk, stunning specialities, and coon chowders happily intersped in climax by selections from the standard operas. The most popular melodies of the day are the creation of these merry singers. They were the first two voiced under the bamboo tree, hot time in the old town tonight, all coons look alike to me, chicken, and innumerable other coon classics that have become popular in the world over. The stage show is given in three parts. First, the darky fun skit Prince Bungaloo, which the New York Herald has termed a blazing sunburst of mirth, melody, and action, followed by a condensed version of the Bohemian Girl and a tip-top vaudeville olio. While no published sheet music or recordings of Larkins's A King Like Me could be located by our researchers, we do have some published music from Black Patty sketches about Zululand. The sheet music for a song called Royal Coon, published in 1907, has survived and gives some sense of how the Zulu king would have been portrayed by Larkins, who also wrote the lyrics and music for that show. In me you see the greatest man who ever held full sway. In Zululand where I reside, I'm monarch in a way. I rule the folks, control the courts, and do just as I choose. I have many entertaining subjects at my house to cure the blues. My great granddad never lived like that. He was a real baboon. But my father was the king of his whole tribe. That makes me a royal coon. I am a royal coon. I hail from Madeline. If there's a doubt about it, I'll prove my ancestry. Cut down my family tree. Look up my pedigree. And you will find out soon I am a royal coon. Now my old dad most all his life did save up each old suit. And once a year, to please himself, he'd paint the Zulus blue. Now I've made up for everything the old man left undone. I give dinners every day or so and have all kinds of fun. On Sunday, I have elephant fried and served by kangaroos. And always for the finishing touch, my Nasserus barbecue. This king is essentially a blackface joke, and he recalls the many fried chicken eating, endlessly partying stereotypes of African Americans common to blackface minstrelsy. The lyrics also open a window into complicated black feelings about Africa during this time period. On one hand, Africa has been imagined as a lost cultural home to black victims of America, as a place to long for. On the other hand, many black Americans internalized the white supremacist idea that the enslaved were better off for having been kidnapped into slavery, for being civilized, and saved from eternal damnation through forced conversion to Christianity. This racist lie was the reasoning of the Confederacy and a myth that neo-Confederates still promote. The idea is well exemplified by Confederate General Robert E. Lee when he wrote in 1856 that, the blacks are immeasurably better off here than in Africa, morally, socially, and physically. The painful discipline they are now undergoing is necessary for their instruction as a race and I hope will prepare and lead them to better things. How long their subjugation may be necessary is known and ordered by a wise, merciful providence. Their emancipation will sooner result from the mild and melting influence of Christianity 
than the storms and tempests of fiery controversy. When we look at a black written and performed minstrel show like A Trip to Africa, in which the Zulu are portrayed as uncivilized and incompetent, and their leaders are played as fools not to be trusted with real power, it's a reminder that feelings of both superiority and shame in relation to Africa have been part of the black American experience, too. The ridicule of black politicians, intellectuals, community and faith leaders were a huge part of blackface minstrelsy and helped to reinforce feelings of white superiority. Southern whites were fearful and indignant about what they called Negro rule, meaning blacks in positions of political power. When minstrelsy portrayed blacks with political power as absurd and incompetent, it reinforced the stereotype that blacks were not worthy of participation in American democracy and soothed white fears about Negro rule with the idea that even if blacks gained political power, they would invariably screw it up out of their own incompetence. So who was Black Patty? It turns out that our life has a lot to teach about the performance options open to black artists at the time of Zulu's founding. Black Patty's real name was Matilda Cesarietta Jones, and she was a classically trained opera singer who studied at the prestigious New England Conservatory of Music, as well as the Boston Conservatory. She got her nickname in the late 19th century from the white press who compared her to Adelina Patti, a famous Italian opera prima donna. Jones is on record saying that she disliked the nickname, along with the comparison to Adelina Patti, and prefer to be called Madame Jones. In most of the ads for the Black Patty Troubadours, she is billed as the finest singer of her race. She performed for the British royal family and at the White House for four sitting U.S. presidents, though only one of them let her come through the front door instead of the back, Roosevelt. She was also regularly turned out of hotel accommodations due to segregationist attitudes when she traveled with her mostly white entourage in her opera days. For instance, an 1895 article in the New Orleans Times Picayune reads, The color line drawn, St. Louis, January 13th. The color line was sharply drawn at the Lindell Hotel when the proprietor refused last night to entertain Mrs. Cecilia Jones, better known as the Black Patty. Rooms for the singer's husband, who was mulatto, and her company, all of the members of which are white, had been engaged two weeks ago. On the refusal of the Lindell management to accommodate the Black Patty and her husband, the entire company engaged quarters at the McLeod Hotel. Mr. Jones indignantly declares that he will bring suit against the proprietors of the Lindell Hotel for $5,000 damages. Despite her talent, major opera companies would not have Cesarietta Jones, usually claiming that despite her talent, there were no black roles in their productions. While she may have been one of the most talented singers of her generation, because she was black, the minstrel circuit was one of the few places where she could actually have a lasting and profitable touring career. Indeed, she was likely one of the best paid black entertainers of her time around 1909 when Zulu was originated. She also appears not to have blackened up in her own shows, leaving this to her cast, but instead offered selections of opera and sentimental ballads at various interviews. In a trip to Africa, she plays the role of Princess Lulu to Larkins' King Rastus. When we speak of the fact that a lot of black performers didn't have viable choices beyond the minstrel sage, Cesarietta Jones is a perfect example, and her story is also a part of Zulu's founding. She wanted to be an opera singer. In a segregated America, the stage that was most open to her was the minstrel stage, and her own name was eventually obliterated by a comparison to a white woman. In 1927, a few years before Jones's death, Mayo Williams, an African-American Paramount employee who decided to strike out on his own and begin a new race record company, created the Black Patty record label using Jones's stage name. An appropriation that, as far as we know, she was never financially compensated for, nor was her permission really sought. The label was short-lived, lasting only a year, but it recorded several dozen early blues, jazz, and gospel pressings. So today, any record with the Black Patty label is considered a rare and valuable collector's item and a window into the early years of Black American music. This is probably why her stage name is still being appropriated to this day by a German blues and roots band who likely associate the name with the allure of these fabled early recordings. Even their merchandise recalls the peacock graphic of the Black Patty label. White folks are still dining out on Cesarietta Jones's legacy. <laughs>